have lots of good posters submitted this year, uh, and we're just going to do some highlights of the posters. So the first one, this is uh, clinical efficacy of relicitinib in patients with alopecia areata. This is a phase 2B and 3 trial. Uh, and now we're going to be looking at patients with uh, clinical measurements of what are called SALT scores. So SALT scores, we've heard a lot about alopecia areata. It's how you grade uh, the hair loss you know, in the different quadrants of the scalp. And looking at also uh, the patient global impression of change in these patients. This is the uh, structure of the clinical trial. We had a few different dosing arms uh, looking at different dosing ranges for this medication. Uh, we had some patients in the dosing arm with a loading dose of 200 milligrams for the first four weeks, and then they were changed down to 50 milligrams or 30 milligrams. And then we had treatment arm with uh, just 50 milligram starting dose uh, out through four weeks and continued onward versus 30 milligrams and 10 milligrams versus placebo. We did have uh, patients aged 12 years and up included, so there were pediatric patients in this clinical study. Uh, with a large percentage of patients who had alopecia totalis or universalis, 46% uh, of patients uh, having that included in the clinical trial as well. So pretty um, significant hair loss here. And I know it's a little bit small, but this top graph right here, this is the change in their SALT scores over time. And, and this is in the different treatment arms here that we have uh, as far as patients uh, over time. And you can see the, the colors here, the star color here is the 200 uh, switching to 50 milligram, and then 200 to 30, and then we have uh, 50 uh, as well as the 30 uh, in these colors. What we have here in these graphs, this is the patient global impression of change. And uh, I think the most um, striking part of this slide here is where we look at uh, patients who rated themselves as greatly improved in this green color. You can see it's pretty consistent in the uh, treatment arms that the longer that patients are on therapy out from week 24 to week 48, you see that this green color gets bigger with time. So these patients, as they are, were on therapy, we looked at them at week 24 and then now to week 48, they continue to get a little bit more hair regrowth, and it's consistent with the SALT score improvement that we saw in clinical trials, too, that these patients are, um, as the patients themselves feel they're getting better, as well as the investigators in the clinical trials. Uh, this is looking at um, the safety in the clinical trials. Uh, the most common adverse reactions uh, that we saw were headache, nasopharyngitis, uh, and uh, upper respiratory tract infections. Um, you know, the, the safety profile was pretty consistent out uh, through week 48. Uh, there were um, eight cases of herpes uh, zoster uh, activation. There was uh, one PE, and, um, there, but there were no major cardiac uh, adverse events or any deaths. Uh, basically, the conclusion of this poster is that SALT scores and patient impression of uh, change, irrespective, uh, in multiple dosing arms, the 200 switching to 50 milligrams, the 200 to 30 milligrams, 50 milligram, and 30 milligram dose groups uh, were uh, higher than placebo, uh, looking at patients at week 24 and then improving out to week 48. Um, and the treatment with relicinib was well tolerated, and the safety profile was consistent in patients in, with healthy volunteers as well as patients with alopecia areata. Uh, the next poster we're going to look at, this is a, a, a new antibiotic, uh, omatocycline, in the treatment of acute bacterial skin infections uh, with cellulitis, uh, cellulitis or abscesses. So amadacycline is a novel aminomethylcycline antibiotic approved for a community-acquired bacterial pneumonia as well as acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections. Uh, it was active against MSSA as well as MRSA. And we were looking at primary endpoints as early clinical response, or ECR, in the intended-to-treat population uh, in randomized patients. And the primary endpoint also looked at survival with at least a 20% or greater reduction in lesion size, uh, 48 to 72 hours after first dose, oh, sorry about that, and um, without rescue therapy, uh, as well as the secondary endpoint was looking at patients post-treatment evaluation in this intended-to-treat population seven to 14 days after the last dose. 
So these are the uh, results of the, the patients, uh, very um, you know, consistent with the mass cyclin versus linazolid uh, as far as the percentages here. That was the comparator. And you can see uh, success at their early clinical response as well as the post-treatment evaluation uh, between the two uh, medications used. Uh, with cellulitis, major abscess uh, in, in both um, the primary endpoint as well as the secondary endpoint. Uh, this is also looking at percentages of patients in, in the different treatment arms with cellulitis versus or, or erysipelas versus major abscess uh, and the two medications used. So conclusions, this uh, amatocycline is a once a day, you can give it as IV or oral dose uh, for inpatient outpatient treatment for uh, patients with cellulitis or major abscess with MSSA or MRSA. And we had a success with uh, early clinical response as well as post-treatment evaluation and were very similar uh, results for these patients with no new safety signals and nausea and, vomit nausea and vomiting were the most frequent uh, treatment AEs noted. All right, so now we're gonna look at a uh, poster looking at uh, treatment of molluscum contagiosum. This is a new product coming to us from Verica Pharmaceuticals. This is VP102, and looking at their phase three trials. So we had uh, two trials, uh, CAMP1 and CAMP2, and basically this was a, a topical that was administered every 21 days to lesions for a maximum of four applications uh, until clearance. And so basically we started treatment at day one here. Uh, they were evaluated 24 hours after the visit. They had their next treatment two at day 21, then treatment three at day 42, treatment four at day 63, and uh, we had an end of study follow-up visit at day 84. This is the baseline characteristics. We had, uh, no surprise here, a lot of pediatric patients age uh, mean of 7, 7.5, 6.3, 7.4, 7.3. Uh, a, a nice split between male and female. Uh, we had a number of patients having um, prior treatment for molluscum, about 30% of patients with a, a, a good percentage of patients having active atopic dermatitis, uh, you know, about 8, 12, 7, 6% here. Uh, and then in a mean a, a lesion count of 22, 25, 19, and 20 lesions, uh, and you can see the range here of how many lesions they had. Uh, this is looking at the uh, more baseline characteristics. A large proportion of these patients were Caucasian in the clinical trials, 89%, 93% here in, in vehicle arm. This is the clinical trial results. I know that there's a lot of bar graphs up here. I, I want you guys to focus on the colored ones first. So they broke it down by uh, skin type. So we have uh, Fitzpatrick 1 or 2, 3 to 4, and then 4 to 5 in these different colors. And you can see the lesion clearing in visit at visit 2. So this is after one application. Uh, visit 3 is after two applications. Visit 4 is after three applications. And end of study is after the total of four applications. So you can see by the time they get out here, uh, irrespective of their Fitzpatrick skin type, they, they have pretty comparable percentages of clearance as compared to placebo here or vehicle, excuse me. Uh, and now this uh, poster is a very interesting poster um, done by uh, Dr. Brian Burke, um, who is studying the uh, use of topical ascorbic acid in a, uh, in a solution DMSO versus topical amiquimod for the treatment of basal cell carcinoma. So we know basal cell carcinoma is something frequently uh, that we see it's uh, the most common cancer diagnosis uh, in the world. Uh, and they used a 30% topical uh, ascorbic acid solution as compared to 5% imiquimod for eight weeks for basal cell carcinoma. And we saw it for Dr. Um, Burke's trial, they saw that 86% of lesions uh, resolved with the ascorbic acid solution versus 57% in imiquimod, and this was confirmed by punch biopsy. Uh, hypopigmentation rates at a 30-month follow-up, 70% seen with imiquimod versus 0% uh, with the ascorbic acid solution. So, um, based off of this poster, it looks like topical ascorbate acid is superior to imiquimod for nodular or superficial basal cell ally at eight weeks, and he is currently enrolling patients for trial with squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, so if you're interested, you can contact him uh, directly. I know this fine print is super small, uh, so sorry, you guys. I, you know, you can check this out in the app. Uh, they essentially, they had um, 29 
basal cells were in the clinical study in uh, 25 patients, and um, they were uh, basically randomized to miquimod or uh, this ascorbate acid solution. 15 of these basal cells were uh, nodular, and six of them were superficial base C. And at uh, eight weeks, um, they found that you know the 86% in the ascorbic acid solution had clearance versus. 57% in the miquimod group. Um, they treated an additional four weeks in the miquimod group, and that elevated the percentage in the miquimod group out to 85%. And so this is uh, just looking at the observed uh, clearance of lesions of imiquimod versus the observed uh, percentage of lesions in the ascorbate acid solution. And again, the null hypothesis was that imiquimod was actually going to do better. And in his study that he found that the ascorbate acid solution actually uh, had a higher clearance of these lesions. Uh, this is a clinical photograph of one of the lesions treated in the study. Uh, this is at baseline. This is after six weeks of treatment, and then this is after eight weeks of treatment. So you have complete lesion resolution here, and they repeated the biopsy, and, and it was negative. All right, and we're going to wrap up with some uh, updates on posters for photo protection, and this is uh, looking at consensus and clinical guideline from an expert panel. So there was a publication, um, and we are going to be looking at the current AAD and FDA photo protection guidance on UV risks. So there's a lot of discussion about UVB and, and filtering um, for, for exposure to that, but there's not as much guidance necessarily on visible light. So a lot of um, the sunlight that we're exposed to is visible light, about 50% of it, which is between the 400 to 700 nanometer range. We have uh, direct effects on the skin with hyperpigmentation, and it can cause erythema, especially in these lighter uh, skin types. And, and currently, the photo protection is primarily for UVB with some UVA2 filtering. And so these UV filters don't protect against visible light. And tinted sunscreens are the only available options, which sometimes are not as cosmetically elegant. So we had a, a publication here in the JAD. Uh, it was a panel of eight expert dermatologists, and, and basically they did some questionnaires to, to get a consensus, and then they, uh, they met, and they were able to uh, come out with a, a nice guideline and a consensus for us that was published. And the summary and conclusions from that uh, is that we need to really recognize that skin care and education on sun protection um, should be personalized, and we should even encourage our darker skin type patients to make sure that they protect themselves from the sun, uh, and looking at how much sun exposure you know, our patients are exposed to, and uh, looking at the individual sunscreen formulations and ingredients. And as we start to learn more about the effects of UV versus visible light, uh, we are, we're looking at um, that there's more information that's coming, and, and we need to understand more of this and educate our patients, because many of our patients, especially of darker skin tone, because they don't burn or get sunburns when they're out uh, as easily as our lighter color patients, they may not be using sunscreens um, you know, as regularly as some of our lighter Fitzpatrick skin type patients. So misconceptions in uh, you know, patients of color. Um, we know that uh, UV radiation is harmful to the skin. And in darker skin types, even though they don't burn uh, like you know, our lighter Fitzpatrick 1, 2, and 3, uh, they can get hyperpigmentation changes. So we can have uh, some hyperpigmentation, some melasma. And, and these are results after you know, a significant photo damage. And you know, as we saw earlier, even patients of skin of color can get skin cancers as well. So we really want to make a push to educate our patients, especially as we see life expectancy starting to climb a little bit, uh, you know, the incidence or the risk for us to develop skin cancer in our lifetime, irrespective of our Fitzpatrick skin type, is there and something that we, we are, should be screening for every day. All right, and uh, looking at the impact of UV light and visible light on skin, uh, we have here, you know, UVB and UVA2. Um, this is primarily going to be what most of the sunscreen filters are currently blocking, uh, but there's not as many um, filters, uh, there's not as much uh, protection for, you know, UVA1 and visible light. 
So disorders of uh, pigmentation issues in patients uh, of Fitzpatrick 4 and higher are common and it's something that we really need to uh, counsel our patients on the misconception of uh, potentially that they don't need sunscreen because they don't burn. That's not necessarily true. We do need to protect our skin against visible light and UVA uh, 1. And current gaps and, and opportunities, so looking at visible light, basically we have the spectrum from 400 to 700 uh, nanometers, and we don't have a uh, good filter for this. So there, there's you know, iron oxides, which sometimes are not as cosmetically um, elegant, and now there's a, a big push for considering um, using antioxidants to bind free radicals that uh, occur due to the visible light, and, and potentially that may negate some of the, the negative effects. So in contrast to UV radiation, the impact on visible light on human skin is only beginning to kind of, uh, we're beginning to tease out those nuances and, and we really need to look at, um, you know, protecting our skin from visible light and some of the downsides from that. And I think this is our, our last part of our poster here. Uh, we talked about this visible light. Other sources, I, I get this patient, question from patients all the time, uh, whether if they look at their cell phone, if that's gonna cause any sort of photo aging or anything like that. Um, the amount of energy emitted from you know, our L, uh, LEDs and our cell phones it is negligible. It's a very, very, very small amount. Uh, so this is not where we get our photo aging from. Uh, it's mostly when we're outside and getting exposed to UV rays as well as visible light. So we have some endogenous antioxidants like glutathione, squalene, CoQ10, uh, uric acid, and vitamin E. And these are things that help uh, bind these free radicals. And you can have them uh, some exogenous uh, antioxidants like vitamin E, vitamin C, glucocalcone A, and DESM. And so basically the idea is when you have visible light, it, it excites a molecule, and that molecule turns into a free radical, and that's what causes the skin damage. So the idea is if you use antioxidants, you're able able to bind those free radicals and prevent some of that sun damage or skin damage. And so we have visible light blocking sunscreens that are tinted sunscreens. Sometimes they're made with inorganic or physical filters like iron oxides, and these are not as cosmetically acceptable to our patients of color. Uh, they tend to leave a residue, kind of a chalky appearance on the skin. Uh, and so now we're kind of starting to explore the, the effects of uh, potentially using antioxidants in lieu of these iron oxide uh, tinted sunscreens. And this is uh, looking at um, some clinical photographs of um, exposure to, you know, um, different sunscreens uh, and then causing a, a little bit of a burn, a sunburn on a patient here. You can see on the, all the way on the left, the U, this is the, the untreated or the control. A is a sunscreen SPF 50. So this is blocking UVB, UVA2. And then B is, this is a tinted sunscreen. And then C, uh, this is an SPF with a five antioxidant shield. Uh, this, was, uh, this is a product made by Eucerin uh, for sunscreen and, and um, control of uh, UVA and visible light. And you can see after one day, the, the clinical photographs of how these patients did. And then after seven days, uh, you can see here, we definitely have less erythema uh, and pigment change uh, with both the SPF uh, 50 with antioxidants uh, as well as the uh, tinted sunscreen. And so in summary, uh, we definitely have to pay attention to the exposures of visible light. Uh, none of us really like uh, you know, the effects of photo aging, but as well as for in, uh, prevalent in our specialties, uh, our uh, skin cancer screenings and, and making sure that we're protecting our patients um, from uh, unwanted exposure. So a, a big push to uh, encourage our patients of darker Fitzpatrick skin types, four, five, and six, uh, to use sunscreen and protect themselves as well. All right, and thank you, and you can see some of these posters in the app.